and a very warm welcome from me, David Foster, to this edition of Round Table. Football is taking a kicking and many clubs away from the powerful premiership a crying foul. Should they be treated just like any other business? The good survive, the rest don't. Or is there something special that needs to be protected? And if so, how? Well, we'll be hearing from the boss of one of the oldest English clubs there is and examine the game's predicament from a supporter's point of view. And we'll be looking at how precarious the profits, if any, can be. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, things are getting ugly for the beautiful game. In England, professional seasons were suspended in March. The Premier League will restart soon with no fans allowed in stadiums. But other leagues are facing an even less certain future. Many clubs outside the top division rely heavily on ticket sales to keep their finances going. But with mass gatherings banned in many countries because of coronavirus, it's unclear when supporters will be allowed back in. Football finance expert Kieran Maguire has said, the industry has been effectively taken out at the knees as a result of the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, many smaller clubs like Englandsbury struggled to balance the books. It was kicked out of the league last September after financial collapse. Now others are facing huge collective losses. According to the English Football League, its 71 clubs are facing losses of more than $250 million by September. The concern is that unless the situation changes soon, some of them will become victims of the pandemic. Well, coming up, we'll hear from former Premier League footballer Osei Sankofa and from the assistant manager of non-league club Aldershot Town, that's Anwar Udin, who's also campaign manager at the Football Supporters Association. But first, very pleased to say we have with us Lee Hoos, the chief executive of Queen's Park Rangers, currently in the second tier of English football. And in a few minutes, we will say hello to football finance expert Declan Ahern from Brand Finance. Good to have you both with us. Um, Lee, I think you're, what, 13th at the moment in the championship. You've reduced your wage bill massively. But you think in the current climate, clubs will fold? I think right now it's a race to the bottom because nobody has any income coming in or very, very limited income coming in. So it kind of whatever you can sell online from your retail operation and whatever central payments you have. And that's a drop in the ocean compared to what you actually need to, to, to take a club forward and to, to meet the bills. And are they necessarily bad businesses or are they just caught up in a, a, a terrible climax of um, a perfect storm, as some people say? Probably a combination of, of both. I think um, there's always been a move towards, you know, making clubs self-sustainable. Um, and I think that is important that we do that. We, 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 we need to get away from shareholder funding. Um, but on the other hand, when you get a situation like this, even if you're a self-sustainable club, um, you've got no revenue coming in right now. So it, it causes a, a, a big, big issue unless you've got um, a lot of reserves to, to, to back you up. So clubs who've managed to save a bit of money might be OK. But what previously was considered sustainable is not going to be considered sustainable right now. And I think it's laid bare the fact that we really need to get away from a, um, a, a beneficiary model going forward a be or a benefactor model going forward. Well, let me ask you about that in just a moment. But you have been effective in reducing costs. I think it's gone down from 78 million, your wage bill, to around about 20 million uh, in just a couple of years. You think others are going to have to bring in wage cuts. How do they go about that? It's not easy because to, to, to make up your mind and try to implement a wage um, cut overnight is it, difficult because most player contracts tend to be on a three-year cycle. Sometimes for um, occasionally you might have a one-year contract for an older player, but by and large, they're three-year cycles. So you're, you're stuck during a transition period with the uh, with the existing contracts. And that was one of the big problems that I had when I first got here is, 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 is transitioning out of the players that were high paid and tra transitioning into the existing contracts that we have now. So not an easy process at all. Um, and then you've also got that dichotomy in the changing room that you have when you, whenever you're bringing in lower um, um, players on lower salaries and the guys on the big box and the, and the guys coming in going, well, how come he's making this? I'm actually playing more than he is and yet he's on a bigger salary than me. So uh, you need the right manager in place to manage that dynamic as well. 
I know you're in the championship, but who do you think is going to feel the pain the most? The, the richer players at the top end, the premiership, the championship, or all those lower down? Players are all going to feel it. In the, in the, I, and, but the, the lower you go in the leagues, the more dependent you are on the, um, on the gate receipts. Uh, you know, Leagues one and league two are almost utterly dependent on league receipts. What they get in central payments is, is next to nothing. So with them being completely shut down, their revenue is ceased altogether, except for the very, very small amount they get um, centrally. So you know, how, how, how they're surviving right now is, um, it, it, it is actually quite a miracle in terms of how they keep going. And quick thoughts on moving away from the benefactor model, as you put it, to, to what? To something that actually you can cut your cloth according to what you actually produce, either on an operational level or from an operational plus player sales scenario. Uh, we know that a club like us, we're a small club. You know, we make no bones about it. We, you know, we're, we're about developing players. If you're, um, as one manager I used to work with, if you're the real deal, um, chances are, you know, you're going to go for, for big money somewhere else. So guys coming to us are going to be like, right, I got something to prove or I just need, I need to polish myself. And we have an infrastructure set up that we can do that. We can polish the players we can get the best out of them and one of two things will happen you know I've, I've, you know this this was the game plan at burnley when i was there which is you get promoted everybody grows together and you get promoted or you might get that you know one player who out, absolutely outshines you know sell him for uh, the registration for a, a large profit reinvest it um bring it, and, and keep bringing the players up until you get to that position where one you're not relying on shareholder funding and two you've got a team that's capable of, of competing and, and possibly getting promoted declan um Change is coming, uh, Lee says. How do you see it? No, I think Lee is, is spot on. Um, and early indications of, of the effect of, of COVID, the effect that it's had on, on football in general, can be seen in the likes of, of Manchester United's latest financial statements. So being listed in, in the US, they're obliged to report quarterly. And their latest quarterly financials showed a, a year-on-year decrease at the same time last year, where they turned from an 11 million pound profit to a 28, 29 million pound, million pound loss in, in this quarter. And uh, they attributed nearly all of that directly to the effects of, of COVID. And that includes you know, a loss in, in match day income and, and a huge loss in, in broadcasting income as well. Well, Rick Parry, chairman of the English Football League Championship, uh, League One and League Two, Two giving evidence to MPs had this to say. In the championship, he claimed 106% of revenue goes on wages. That's more than they bring in. League one and two, 80 to 90%. And he ended up with this. Perhaps one benefit of going through this pain is we will be shocked into coming up with a more sustainable model for the future. We've heard Lee's thoughts on one aspect of that. Declan, your thoughts on what would be more sustainable? It's it's very difficult. You know, I think we we live in a time where where football players are are paid extremely well. Um, transfers for for footballers are are extremely high as well, and there at the top end is an over reliance on on large broadcasting revenues, but then at the bottom end there's there's a huge reliance on on ticketing sales and and benefactors and um, volunteer work within stadiums, for example, just to keep to keep clubs going. Um, you know, as as Lee uh, alluded to, you know, one option is is to improve academies and grassroots football and and try and turn a profit that way by by growing um, football players' abilities and and therefore their standing in in the public and and try to sell them at a, at a higher price than you than you brought them in for. But ultimately, not every club and every academy can can go down that avenue. Lee, if Rick Parry is right and in the championship. Um more money is being spent on wages than is being brought in in whatever form. It was wrong long before COVID, wasn't it? Oh, it's it's been around for a long, long, long time. Yes, I, but I think what this has highlighted is the the, the actual disparity in revenues between clubs and between divisions. Um, and of, of course, one thing you know, you mentioned that word sustainable, um, but sustainable. Sustainable just means you can you can pay your, your your bills when they come due. You know we currently have profitability and sustainability rules, which um, Bolton were in compliance. Um, however, they went almost got liquidated and and, um, and 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 but did go into administration. So sustainable means can you can you pay your bills on time? Um, and with a benefactor model, when something happens to the benefactor's business, then the whole thing goes very very wrong. You know, if, but if you look at the disparity, you know, in the Premier League. 
they tend not to have benefactor models. They can stand on their own two feet because of the revenue coming in. Some of that revenue, because of the how interconnected all English football is in the football pyramid, there has to be a better distribution model and there has to be more cooperation. Okay. So if it is the, this pyramid structure and you, the top you've got clubs, notwithstanding the fact that Declan says Manchester United are going through a bit of a rough time financially at the moment, should not the richest clubs be giving more to those in the lower leagues than they are at the moment? First, uh, you on that one, Lee. Yeah, I, I think that you, you really do have to look at how it works between, first of all, the, the Premier League and the Championship, um, because right now it is an absolute drop off when you get relegated from the Premier League to the to the championship. Um, now they're not quite so severe a drop off when you go from the championship to League One. So all of that, there, there should be a much smoother transition and a, and a, and a, and a bit broader base of um, of uh, revenue that goes around to everyone. And even things like, um, for me, EPPP, Elite Player um, Production Plan, you know, that really needs to be looked at because right now the big clubs can, you know, if you're trying, if you are trying to build a business with younger players and bringing them through the academy, um, as Declan said, it's not for every club, but if you are trying it, EPPP prescribes exactly what you uh, a club has to pay for a, a young player below the age of 16. So while you're trying to get your best players, you know the bigger clubs can accumulate those players, which means that business plan goes out the window as well. So really the fairness, the inherent fairness of football in terms of player development and about revenue, all of it really needs to be looked at. I think it just needs a fundamental reboot, quite frankly. Okay, well, that, that's fascinating. Uh, Declan, solidarity payments, I think, at the moment, 125 million from the Premiership, 125 million out of revenue of two and a half billion. They, they should be doing more, shouldn't they? Yes, I think so. You, you could argue that, you know, just in broadcasting revenue, uh, the Premier League made two and a half, half billion in the 2019 season, and 125 million of that this year they've committed. Um, as a payment up front to, to help teams below the Premier League manage with this crisis. But really, compared to, to the amount of money that the Premier League make, that is a, a small, small drop in, in the ocean. OK, final question, um, starting pretty much where we finished. I think there are 72 clubs um, in the Football League, the English Football League. Declan, how many do you think will survive this? Oh, it's difficult to say. I'd estimate you'd see at least a quarter going to very close to, to liquidation or, or business administration without uh, support, even though the government has put in schemes to, to support, particularly um, you know, non-league uh, teams that can take advantage of that, I still don't think that support is enough. And the uncertainty going forward means that we don't actually know whether we'll have fans in stadiums, not just a year from now, but, but perhaps further along into the future. And, and of course, there yeah. are, are a huge range of knock-on effects on the economy. Uh, Lee alluded to the benefactor model. If those benefactors are feeling the pinch from an economic turndown, there's no guarantee that those funds that were previously available to, to clubs would be available in, in the future. Declan, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Lee, some clubs will go out of business. Uh, will it be sad to see them go or will it be better without them? It's always sad to see a, a club go out of business. Um, and there's actually 70, we're in the unique situation this year of 71 clubs in the in the Football League because Barry got liquidated. Um, and, you know, Barry is a great example about clubs going out. A huge, huge community club. It does a lot of good in the, in the, in the town of Barry. People sometimes miss the uh, the off pitch stuff, the stuff that the community things that that, that uh, really the football clubs really help with. And I think that is a, a a travesty when a club's allowed to go out that way. Seventy one, not seventy two. I take a yellow card, and I thank you both very much <laughs> indeed uh, for joining us on this round table. Uh, Lee Hoos and Declan Ahern, great to have you with us. Thank you. My pleasure. A time now to welcome former Premier League football ex Charlton Athletic, Ossis Sankofa, and the assistant manager of non league club Aldershot Town, Anwar Uddin, who's also campaign manager of the Football Supporters Association. Great to have you both on the programme. Anwar, let's come to you and Aldershot first of all. Biggest crowd I could find was 2,700. Uh, year ending. Uh, 2018, three quarters of a million pound loss last year, over one million owed to creditors. Um, guest in the early part of the programme said he reckoned a quarter of clubs would go out of business. So how are you going to avoid doing that? We have to be careful. It's uncertain terms. And I think we have to be realistic in our future endeavours. But I'm confident that with a club like ours, who we're meticulous in what we do, and we try not to overspend. I think if we're careful 
and we approach the future with caution, I think we'll be okay. But um, I think a lot of clubs are going to find themselves in difficult waters in the near future. If you don't have any crowds, and that's not at all certain in the immediate term, let alone in the long term, um, how are you going to manage? To put that quite simply, I don't think non-league clubs can manage. Um, with crowds come income. With income, you're in that you can enables you to pay your players, the staff, the running costs of the club. Um, and in all honesty, at the best of times, non-league football is difficult from, you know, league two down all the way to some of these grassroots teams in non-league without sponsors, without help, without volunteers and definitely without fans. It's almost impossible to run a football club the way in which you'd like to. So in an ideal world, we'd need fans to attend. We'd need to create an atmosphere in our stadium and improve our revenue sources to, to be able to continue. Are you paying too much? Because this was one of the points we made in the earlier part of the programme, that some clubs are living beyond their means. Let me ask you about Aldershot's wage bill. What does your highest paid player earn per year? You know, the average sort of pay in our league could range from something like 200 to 1,500. The bigger teams, you could look at maybe even double that. In all honesty, it's a competition. Sorry, is that per week, per month? or help That's me that. per week. 200? That's per week. Yeah, but maybe so, 1500 a week, which is 75000 a year for your best paid, yeah? Yeah, so a good team with an average budget, I'd say yes. Um, and to be honest, if you want to be the best team with the best players, you might have to pay players around that and even more. Um, but if you don't have the money come in, I don't think you're going to be able to do that. So I think looking in terms of what our future looks like, I think people need to be a bit more realistic with what they pay and how they go about their business. OK, um, also, let me come to you. you. You hear about a club here that doesn't get very big gates. You hear about how much it owed last season. You hear about the determination of someone like Anwar and the rest of them at Aldershot Town. Does that give you hope or are they being a bit ridiculous and thinking they can survive? No, I think a club like Aldershot has got more of a chance of survival than clubs a bit further down the pyramid. I think Aldershot Town have a genuine fan base. I think they're still an attractive club for people to potentially want to invest, local businessmen and women could still invest in those clubs. But I think the real issue are clubs, you know, below the League Two pyramid into the non-league pyramid, which is where I think the real problems will start. I think there'll be a lot of turnover in club ownership. I think players' wages will be driven down. And it's a very uncertain time. That, and it's no wonder that non-league are desperate for the government to get involved to save what will eventually be the loss of several clubs. Is that at all likely? Government backing? Who, who knows? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine that they're a priority right now compared to league clubs that have, had, have existed for 100 years. You know, Berry fell out of the Football League this year and there was huge outcry about that. And I don't think that the government will be allowing that to happen too many times for league clubs. But for non-league clubs, I think it's going to be a case of you're going to have to wait your turn. And what are you hearing about getting any help from the central government? The furlough scheme has helped so many over this period. I think that will go on for a few months. But I think in terms of the, the bigger picture and long term, I think the government will need to look at football because, as you mentioned there, I'll say, some clubs have unfortunately you know, diminished in recent history. And these are, these are football clubs that have been going for years. And I think if the government could look at that, look at the ownership of football clubs, look at the model, look at the structure of how football works, the mechanics of it, um, and give it some support because football is a key part of our history and a significant part of our everyday life in England. And I think it's very, very important that we do as much as we can to help our local clubs. The top clubs, they make a lot of money. There's a lot of money involved in football at the highest levels. But when you start to trickle down the pyramid, those football clubs need help. They need volunteers. They need sponsorship. And if they can get anything in addition to that from the government, that would be fantastic. Yeah, let's, let's um, put up on screen some words from Kenny Saunders, Save Grassroots Football Campaign. Uh, pitches will be sold by councils to fund rescue packages. There'll be a knock-on effect on kids' health in terms of rising obesity levels and psychological consequences. We are not in this game to produce the next Premier League star. We do it to help kids get fit and make friends. And both of you, you, you first, Anwar. That is what this is about. Um, football at the very basement level suffering as well. I think that's everything. Myself and Nosse would not have had the careers we had if there wasn't grassroots football teams, if there wasn't parents and volunteers that were willing to put together teams, run teams. And it takes time and effort. 
that is where help has been needed for a long, long time. Not just now for this current crisis. I think grassroots football needs as much help as possible from more volunteers, from the government, from football itself. And if it can get that, it can produce a foundation which can then produce players um, in the England team for the future years. When you say from football itself, do you mean from those rich clubs that are perhaps holding on to all of their money rather than passing it down to you? And are you, you then, then, then on to you, I say? For me, I think if you have a massive club, you know, that's got great fan base at the very highest levels of, of the game in England, if there are any way in which that club can support their non-league grassroots teams, their non-league clubs, I think there's probably creative ways we can look at to, to do that. And it may just mean player appearances. It may mean using uh, training facilities. I think if we can work together and help each other in the future, that will do a lot for grassroots football. Because I think sometimes it's taken for granted, if, if you want my honest opinion. So that's quite interesting, I'll say, isn't it? I mean, you get Manchester City, let us say, twinned um, with Yeovil Town. You, you might get all the shot twinned with, um, I'll say Liverpool. You, you may not want that one, uh, and why, but I mean, I'll say it. It's like two towns twinning to get uh, a benefit for both of them. But in this case, one of them's the, the real baby. Is that is that happening at all? I think it should be happening a lot more. I, I've, I've, it's always puzzled me why you have clubs higher up the pyramid that don't have some sort of association with their you know, lower league counterparts. For example, I started off my career and spent 10 years at, at Charlton Athletic. Now, one of the local clubs that they have is Welling United, which is not far from Charlton Athletic. And apart from a pre-season friendly that happens once in the summer every season, I'm not sure there's a real connection between the two clubs. So it doesn't always have to be financial. It, it could potentially be the loaning of young players. It could be the giving of you know, resources that are not being used anymore to these clubs. So I think there's lots of creative ways that, that clubs could be could develop partnerships. In regard to Premier League funding, I think the Premier League would argue that, that they are doing their bit in regard to money that they distribute amongst the amongst the leagues, which they do. So I think it's up to people to also, you know, for the Premier League to also do a little bit more, but for also people to be creative. It's now time for mums and dads aunties and uncles to get more involved in making sure that there are supervised activities for young people in parks. There's so much green space in London that I've had the pleasure of walking around during this lockdown. And I'd like to see that being utilised a bit more by local communities, especially with the cuts that have been made. There is still lots of open green space that people can utilise if they're prepared to get out, spread the, spread the, the workload around between the mums and dads and get these young kids out there active, especially with the summer months coming. OK, what about a, a tax imposed upon the richest clubs that is distributed by somebody, um, it's being suggested, who is called the football czar? I mean, should that be the sports minister at the moment or do you need someone independently who can take a look at the whole setup and say, actually, this is what we can do to save the very best uh, for everybody from the, you know, the kids in the park right up to the top of the Premier League? Well, uh, people are always going to ask for, for, for more money if they feel that it's available. I, it's hard to, to sympathise with an organisation that, that turns over hundreds of millions of, of pounds every single year. But the danger also is that you, you're, you're pushing the bigger clubs away by saying, if you keep asking for money, they're going to say, well, we're going to take our business elsewhere and keep it amongst ourselves. We've already heard about super leagues and things of this nature. We want the English clubs to stay in the league, but there needs to be more, more communication, more connectivity mm. between clubs at the top and clubs at the bottom and i've, I've already listed okay, some that, of the ways that that can okay. be done that, that, just... that would be fascinating that would be fascinating and well we're coming to the end of this and your role with the football as a supporters campaign means that you you love the game as much as you uh, enjoy it as a, as a business and as an ex-player um I, I wonder how you think supporters will feel when they see even um what some might regard as the smallest club go under it's part of a community isn't it this is the key thing a football club is the heartbeat of a community and what really kind of impressed me this year was that when Barry were going through a, an ordeal you know because that's what it was the whole of the football community fans from all over the country actually wanted to get involved in saving that club is there anything we can do as rival supporters to make sure this club still exists next year and that's one thing about football fans in this country football fans will come together to make sure football exists and football is strong and football lasts forever. All these ideas are great, 
what can we do for our football for its long-term sustainability? Because that's what it needs. Let's not be having these same conversations about grassroots football in five or 10 years' time. Let's see if we can get around the table and figure out the best ways to make football survive. But unfortunately, it didn't save Berry, did it? Fans' loyalty didn't, <laughs> just didn't work. It didn't work. And sometimes, you know, what owners do to football clubs and uh, the way in which it's run, the mismanagement, sometimes it's too much to save. But, you know, in some cases, you can look at clubs like AFC Wimbledon. Um, there are other examples of teams that start again from the very, very bottom and obviously rise above and get back into the football league. So, you know, if the passion is there for a club, by loyal local supporters, they will find a way. And that's something that, you know, I can't talk highly enough. Football fans will go above and beyond for their football club. And believe it or not, they will go above and beyond for other football clubs because we all want football to survive. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't always work. Fans' loyalty doesn't pay the wages. Thank you very, very much indeed. I say thank you, Anwar. And thank you very much indeed for watching this edition of Roundtable on the precarious future facing football. From me, David Foster, from all of those who made this show possible. We'll see you next time, I hope. Bye-bye.